Hi, friends. Welcome back to With Great People, the podcast for high-performance teams. I'm Richard Kasparowski. Our special guest today is Patricia Kong. Um, so I first met Patricia as a public speaker. She is a great public speaker. She leads enterprise and leadership solutions at Scrum.org. Patricia is the co-author of the Nexus Framework for Scaling Scrum and the Evidence-Based Management Framework, which I want to know more about. And she's also the co-author of the book, The Nexus Framework for Scaling Scrum. To support this podcast, visit my website, kasparowski.com. Hey, Patricia, thanks so much Hi. for joining us today. <laughs> um, we're terrible at naming folks and stuff, aren't we? It's not great, but I was just thinking, wow, could have, could have done better with that title, huh? Um, Patricia, is there anything else you'd like to add on to that introduction? Anything else uh, Anything else? listeners and viewers could know about you? Um, I am originally from the Massachusetts area. I uh, work at Scrum.org. I'm actually in the office right now alone. Um, and uh, not if, so when you guys come visit, I won't be here. Uh, it was published. And then um, I used to live in France for a little bit. And then I said, I drank all the wine. I'm going to go back. Go back home now. Because <laughs> we have wine here too, it turns out. We have wine. It's not as good nor as cheap. But <laughs> I did what I had to do. Um, all right. I'm really curious about this evidence-based management framework that it, it's new to me. I think I've heard about it. I think I read a sentence about it. What is it? Will you, will you tell us more about that? Yeah. Yes. Yes, I will. Actually, I'll do more than that. I'll actually let you know um, the genesis of it, why we, why we created it. So um, this framework um, probably about 10 years ago or something like, I don't know, let's just, COVID has got my brain and like timelines really mixed up, but like once upon a time, there were many organizations that were really concerned about um, thinking about how they could do better and scale and become bigger and all these things. And we said, well, that's really interesting. What would we look at if we were thinking about how would you use agile principles and scrum to continuously improve your company. Um, and we were exploring that topic. So we were, were creating something called the Continuous Improvement Framework, which we call SIF. SIF happens to be a washing, cleaning, disinfectant product in the UK, so we couldn't call it that. And it was almost too early for the conversation because organizations were just thinking at that time about how do we get bigger, better, more agile right now. And we said, hold on, slow, slow your courses or whatever that is. Um, <laughs> and let's just see how would you do this with intention and if you're using agility in a way that actually um, improves what you're doing um, because you know especially Rich, with all the work that you think about teams it's not just you just put more people and it's going to happen faster it's a how do we actually know what goals we're working toward um, and we've actually added this piece back into the EBM um, framework and the guide but this notion of continuous improvement really thinking about the goals that you're working on, that they're really outcome-based, that it's not just like, hey, we need 100 new subscribers by the end of the year, you know, to think about it from a more strategic point of view and then say, what are some of the experiments that we can reach that point? That's cool. So obviously, hey, we're, we're the inspect and adapt people, let's do that. But thinking about and asking organizations, when you actually talk about this notion of value, what would that look like? So where are you now, current value? What opportunities do you have outside that's unrealized value? And then are you capable of delivering those things? So time to market and your ability to innovate, how would you measure and define those things so that you can actually improve towards the goals? Mm -hmm. um, that was a really long winded explanation and I did not give you a definition, uh, but was that okay? That's amazing, thank you. <laughs> I gave you a history. And I love it. Um, that's cool. Evidence-based management framework. And I'm thinking, you know, Scrum is an evidence-based management framework. Holy crap. Oh, my gosh. Not everybody would think that. Would <laughs> Wait, so Scrum isn't just, uh, you know, a set of rituals that we have to follow without thinking? No, Wait we should. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we should think. I would suggest thinking. Okay. Um, and we should use, um, you know... If you have a um, if you have a scrum team that you're working on, you should be thinking about how you could use events and the the accountabilities there to um, 
think about transparency so that we could just try to get a little bit better at doing what we're doing. All right, let me stop faking the fun. Are you experiencing any improvement fatigue um, or this process exhaustion during COVID? Improvement fatigue or process exhaustion, like me, me personally. It's to everyone and the team yeah. of people behind you. <laughs> <laughs> Who's behind me? <laughs> they're wearing a mask. What was that question again? Are people experiencing improvement fatigue? The notion that you need to keep on improving. You need to keep on improving your health and trying to do this. The notion that you keep need to improve what you're doing at work. Um, and what I realized, at least for me, when I was thinking about this, it was just, you know, during the times you have more time to reflect and I was just getting really fatigued by you know kind of keeping up the good fight when we talk about you know we can be better we can do these things transformation and what i realized and especially with the addition of the focus of goals in the scrum guide is that um this notion of intention and goals and things that that actually are necessary to make us kind of understand what direction um, that we're going toward are important for us to lessen that fatigue. I think that we kind of point and say, do better, do better. You can do better. You can do better, but like do better toward what has, has been missing. Uh, and this has been a really crucial addition, I think, um, to the scrum guide, but also evidence-based management. We purposefully added three layers of how you can think about goals or this notion of, you know, teams are using, I don't know if you've seen this, but like OKRs and they're just like, yeah, we have OKRs now, but when you actually think about what they're using as their goals or their objectives. It's just micromanagement in a different way. Yeah. I've been having those conversations. It's what yeah. I've been thinking about. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. I get that. I get that. So not just OKRs, not just measuring stuff, but being intentional about what you want and, and finding a way to move toward it. Yeah. Like you're trying to get back to your fight way. And it's your, it's not just the, the number on the scale, Rich, not just the number on the scale. What is it? Hmm. This is actually really important for me to remember. It's not just a number on a scale. It's it's how you feel and it's what you want for yourself, right? Yeah. Okay. I want to bring this to teams now. And we've we talked about teams a little bit. You, you mentioned this idea of being intentional with your team. Uh, should your team keep improving? This is a podcast about teams, and the, the question I, I, I like to ask my guests is about the best team of your life. What's the best team that you've ever been on in your life, a team that you've been part of? Not, you know, we, we coach and we consult and we teach, but not that kind of team, a team that you were part of. And, and I mean any kind of team. So this is really broad, like any group of two or more people aligned with a, a common goal. That's a team. So it could be a work team. It could be any group of two or more people aligned with a common goal. What's your best team of your life? <laughs> I think the best team of my life was um, I was working in a startup and we were struggling for money and we would work long hours and we would entertain ourselves. And we were really passionate, obviously, about building our product. We just had fun. And there were so many challenges that were against us that we overcame. So this was actually a time when I was uh, living in um, France and my French wasn't that good, but it was good enough at that point to be kind of this, you know, work on this team uh, from the product perspective. And not only am I doing that, but I'm working with these developers who weren't that fascinated by communicating with an American woman in the first place. <laughs> So we just had some of these like things that we were trying to get through, but it was really interesting. And I was learning to adapt into that, that culture um, in terms of just living there. But the, that team for me was, it was just intense work, really fun. We had all these other kind of things like shooting at us, but um, it became so comfortable. We're always locked into this one room. So our building, we were in a startup because uh, there was low rent, we were in the oldest brothel in Paris. So our office was like the second, second, third floor in the oldest brothel, Le Chabonnet. Was in, it still a brothel? It was not. Still <laughs> what a kind brothel. of startup was this? 
<laughs> oh god, I can't even get into that because it's kind of ironic. But the um, there in, in this building, there was like um, the menu from the old days, and like literally our office had <laughs> there are themes. It was very interesting. It's very there's a lot of history. Yeah. But we just had like so it wasn't like we were we weren't in the most beautiful like modern building or anything. But we just had a sense of purpose. We like mm-hmm. used to just throw toilet paper at each other. <laughs> We were working um, really hard together and it was, it was just awesome when we got things done because we had so many things against us. And then just, you know, the, the, the notion that we were gelling together, personalities were gelling together. Um, we were all really different. So when people talk about like diversity, we're just different in many different ways, personalities and coming together for that purpose um, to like, you know, still have a job. Those, those, even those kind of things were, were all there for us. All right. Uh, I love all the, um, all the, all the concrete detail you added. I can, I, I don't know if I'm picturing exactly what you're picturing, but I'm, I'm picturing, uh, I'm picturing this team and in this workplace it, I want to be part of that team. <laughs> we would do, we would, I mean, nights of champagne, we're all suffering together. We would do date, you know, like these cheers. Yep. We would like just to entertain ourselves in our 14 hour days, 16 hour days. We would like race each other crash into each other like bumper cars and that was a fun team that was i mean that was really i've been on other really great teams but i mean when i think of all the things that were kind of all the pressures that were against us yeah yeah it's fascinating all right so so we're already there we're already back with this team reliving it if you could summarize the the i don't know the sensation of this team of, of being there working together uh, if you could summarize all of that the way it feels to you in one word what would that one word be adequate adequate okay (laughs) tell me more about adequate i think when you're in a space where you're trying where you're racing against time and you may or may not be building and producing and creating a business that will be good enough and you are aligning with people who sometimes feel like they're misfits and you're just you may have this feeling that you're really passionate about something, but you have this fear that you are inadequate. And what you're coming through this experience feeling is that I've been afraid of, we have been afraid of being inadequate and that might be picky or whatever about something, but together what we realize is individually and as a team, we are more than adequate we are we're actually you know pretty strong and powerful and we get stuff done and all those kind of things and we have fun and we like each other and we enrich each other's lives and stuff like that nice okay and um you know some uh, oh empirical based observations how, how do you know that this was the best team and, and this could be subjectively this could be objectively what are some some ways that you know this was the best team of your life i think when you asked me it's the one i thought of no um i think i think from um an execution perspective not because that's actually what led my journey to understand learn more about agile okay um so you know you can have a really great team and you can be working on really cool stuff or you could be working on stuff but is that really actually valuable to the organization and to the world is something that is important to consider later. So there's all these blind spots that I had at this time, Mm -hmm. but um, I think what, what made it particularly interesting for me from a subjective point of view is that feeling that I just explained, like to, to overcome something where you take a lot of people who feel like they're just individuals and then come together as a team Mm-hmm. And as that team feel like you suck, and then to be like, it's actually we don't suck, and if we suck, we're gonna suck together. But that yeah. whole thing of everybody being together um, and having a lot of transparency uh, is really interesting. So the, all the things that we talk about before we even realize we're doing what you know we would call agile or all these things, they were they're already there, and that's that's why when you're learning and experiencing these things, that you actually can work in a different way previously to the way that I have worked, which is a really corporate experience. Um, I think that that's what helped change me as a person, change how I think about things. Okay. Could you share one of these changes? What's an example of one of these changes? 
Um, I think that I come from a background, for instance, that just it's it's really about top down. Okay. And there's not value in the teams. It's just this kick it, you know, this kind of thing. And when we were learning in that space, like that didn't, it just doesn't work. Right. And I think that that the notion of you know, learning about bottom-up intelligence, really getting people out talking to the customers, um, really thinking about how we consider products and users. That was very that was very different. But really, the subtle thing is is about how you think about management and leadership, and in, in terms of teams. If we agree that teams are what create value, then we can understand and think about it differently rather than, you know, how would we support that? What do other people do who are not in the team or do you come into the team? Like what do all those things mean? And so this, this, this skill that you learn, especially when you're in this environment coming from a corporate environment and just also my background is how do you start to manage up? How do you start to change that conversation? How do you invite trust? Like those, mm -hmm. those things um, rather than it's like, you know, the person on top of the triangle is the smartest person. And that's where you're trying to go. Um, my career has been very much smaller and smaller and smaller in terms of the size of organization I work with. Mm -hmm. How about some, some concrete behaviors from this team? What are, what are some of the very concrete things that you did together uh, you know, toward execution and, and, and all this goodness that you experienced? You know what's super interesting is when um, you look at the way that teams come together and this is like from the psychology aspect and something that I learned years ago from my professor at school. We did a lot of the behaviors to try to create this notion of, um, you know, connection to create these, these, these fake connections. So what you see is when you have these young teams together or, you know, whatever they're, what's important to them is this, like, let's go drinking, let's have drinks together. Let's do all that stuff. And, you know, then we're going to, we have this, we create these events that kind of help um, artificially create whatever. This doesn't work with French people and American people and everybody who can't speak and all these things. Okay. But um, so what became really important was what we were able to collaborate on and work on as a team. And so the, the notion, even the language issue that like previously I could get by just working in English, I could have whatever done that but it was so important that I adapted their language to speak French and to do all these things and to take it as far as I could go um, and then their willingness to help me with that was really creating a good connection but it also created a much more I don't know if it's a safe space but it just created these other things that we were willing to do for each other to learn about each other culturally I think was really interesting but I I would say like I knew French well enough but it was really working with this team because they spoke French and they didn't want to speak English and I'm in their country that took me to another level. And then seeing that I think created more trust and a little less conflict, especially when you're speaking in another language and trying to work in another language. Yeah. There's just different the behaviors where it was just like, you know, I've always been used to just being eating lunch in front of my screen. And they were like, this is not, that's not how we roll. Like, like an American. How I roll, right. <laughs> yeah. So we would make a compromise once a week. We'll go out and we'll have a lunch together and all those times to really just connect as people. We did, um, we started to do, it was the, what you started to see was behaviors where we would start to be together even though we didn't have to. And we would start to do like learning sessions. So like we would present on things that we were interested about and learning and it was just really like enriching each other. And then, you know, the typical stuff, drinking champagne on Tuesdays, you know, in our, brothel office <laughs> being poor and being happy about it you know typical team stuff going to the brothel to drink champagne on tuesdays yep uh, um, amongst many other things we may have done but it was really this bonding and this gelling um but i think this being very clear also about the things that we were working on because we only had a certain runway yeah you know in, in my experience that gives a lot of focus right when you're uh i'll, I'll say an underfunded startup, and especially if, if, the, if the owners are, are transparent about how much money there is and what the runway is, how much time there is left, 
it brings a lot of focus. Yeah, I think there's that always that pressure. I mean, you don't have to count down to like the dollars, but there's yeah. um, the 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 that really brings a focus of you know what we're trying to do and then what this would mean for us if not. So maybe that's leading by fear. I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the, the that yeah it was uh yeah i that degree of focus that degree of um you know we're in it together was very much there i think i think for me it, it's really interesting like when people think about dan pink stuff um or you think about maslow's hierarchy right so you have all these things that you need and i think especially in the agile world there's you know there's these two levels in, in maslow's hierarchy that's really around um belonging and um, esteem. And so if you tie that into like, I'm just thinking this through now, when you're talking about when I said adequate, I think that that was, maybe that's embracing those levels that might be missing sometimes when you're when you're in a team, like there's like, you know, we're, we're motivated, we wanna do that. But if we're thinking about, I think that's why I really do have the sticky. I've never really thought about, do you think you're in a team rather than just individuals? It's like, yeah. Is that is that belonging there? How do we feel about our ourselves and together? Yeah. And do we agree with that? Yeah. Well, I'd love to hear some advice for listeners. You know, this team's success. Uh, how could how could listeners and viewers reproduce? I don't know if you can re- reproduce that experience because I have not been able to reproduce that experience. <laughs> But it was that time, right? So it's that team. But I have had great experiences from there learning, and especially at, at that time, just learning more about how you can work together with the team. Um, and and I've certainly worked on teams that have been more effective since then. We were more rigorous. But I think the journey of experiencing what it takes to gel on a team, um, I think for me, it's really that focus that just you know brings people together and. Um, experiencing conflicts together so things that pull you back and being able to go get over them that just builds a lot more trust and i've always been you know i'm a pretty um transparent person but i think the the was a really great experience that has probably built me to be very transparent and authentic in how i approach work Mm -hmm. but i think for teams if they can really think about are you really in a team and if you're not do you need to exit that team? Do you need to exit that group or should you be figuring out what could make you a team? And is it because that there is not a shared intention or goal or focus, would that help you become uh, more of a team so that you're working on something together? Because you just defined a team really quickly, right? Like when we said, what's a team, you know, you've got to work on a, trying to solve this problem. And a lot of times they're not doing that. I think it's almost like that simplifying and understanding that basic thing first to see how we could uh, gel together but other the other things all that that was that was just a bonus great life experience (laughs) and i love that question are you really on a team that's such a good question is there anything else you'd like to add so i went through the ebm the evidence-based management stuff quite cheeky but um, that that there's more information there that's available on the Scrum.org website. There's an EBM guy, and it's 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 so amazing, Rich, that you were like, wait, isn't Scrum like an evidence base? And and that's the thing is that it's not always used that way. So if we're really trying to think about you know goals that are valuable for us to pursue opportunities, and we're working on that, then you know, what is the evidence that we have that will help us manage our environments to work toward that way? That's really what we're working on. And it's, it's a hard uh, problem. Measurements get articulated in different ways. Um, so we're, we're working on that. And, um, you know, we have, we released an assessment and we're working on uh, some sort of work, virtual workshop that people can can look forward to an experience um, to just kind of say, you know, what are the measurements that we need to show that we're really improving toward value? Um, I think this day and time, I don't know what, what the listeners are, are thinking, um, but it's just, I think people are thinking a lot more about how they invest themselves and their time. This is also a meaning of the organizations too. And so I think if they're thinking about the goals that they're pursuing are, 
are, are closing some new opportunity. That's great. Um, other stuff in general, I don't know, in terms of like scaling, I'm really interested in um, when I talk about scaling now, and we've actually just released updated the Nexus guide. It was the notion of being very clear that what we're trying to talk about is scaling your problem or a solution. Are you trying to scale value? And I'm very focused now on what does it mean to scale down, descale, because you're going to get more out of that. And if you simply think about your problems, you know, what, what led you to become that scale? What would you need to do to, to bring that back down? Um, and do you have a scaling problem or, for instance, a product problem? Yeah. Because that really messes up teams and what they can do. And they're stuck. Um, so a lot of those kind of things. That's what so, I'm thinking about. That's cool. That's cool. I, I like that idea, the idea of scaling value. It's not just scaling number of people who could work together on a problem. Scaling more people, scaling more teams, scaling the product. Yeah. Patricia, how could listeners contact you? If they wanted to contact me, I am on LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, Patricia Kong, K-O-N-G. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, send me a message, add me, and you know we can continue engaging in the conversation. Um, there's there's different ways. Um, I'm on the internet. They can see more of my uh, random stuff and reach out to me in different ways. All right. This has been a really fun, I don't know how, it's going to be like a half hour episode. I don't know. But we've been here together for a, an hour now, over an hour now. This has been really, really super fun for me. A really a great highlight to my day. Thank you so much for joining us, Patricia. Thank you. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. And remember to support this podcast. Visit my website, kasparowski.com. <laughs>